Remember that, what, that science has become dedicated to explaining how our world came to be through pure naturalism. That by and large, the scientific community holds to an atheistic worldview, and they're dedicated to naturalism. They, uh, they would argue that all physical phenomena must be explained as occurring through purely natural processes, and the origin of everything we see must, again, be explained as coming into existence through purely natural processes. This is the, the view that the scientific community has adopted. And because we live in a world with a supernatural history, we should be very skeptical about what scientists are teaching today, in particular with regard to ancient Earth history and the origin of this world, the origin of life on Earth. So our goal, largely, is to help people understand how the conflicts can be reconciled between what science is teaching today and what the Bible is teaching. But to correctly do this, we must be interpreting scientific findings ourselves consistent with the biblical worldview. What we should not be doing is allowing an atheistic science scientist to interpret the world that's around us and assume that's correct. And then look to see how we can twist scripture around to force it to not be in conflict. We need to be interpreting scientific findings ourselves consistent with the biblical worldview. And that's what we're going to be doing tonight. My goal is to show you how fossils and the fossil record can be interpreted, should be interpreted from the biblical worldview. Now, there are a lot of people that would argue that it really doesn't matter. You know, all that really matters is faith in Christ. And this is true. We're all about Jesus, all about uh, apologetics is all about teaching the, the brotherhood, our, the, the church, how to be an effective witness for Christ. But today, to, when you witness to people about your belief, when you witness to people about your belief in the Bible, your faith in Jesus Christ, you inevitably are going to need to answer some questions about ancient earth history, the conflicts that appear to exist between what the Bible is teaching and what science is teaching. And uh, I mean, it is important. I, I, in my opinion, th these, the teachings of science today can be a significant impediment that can keep someone from coming to the faith unless their questions about these conflicts are adequately answered. And for many people that gr have grown up in the church, the teachings of science today can lead to a loss of faith. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been contacted by a student former student of mine after they after they got up into college you know with it, that are in the middle of a faith crisis asking for help to answer some of these questions uh, giving to get a response of, regarding some of the teachings that they are receiving in college that are conflicting with the bible and that are causing them to have a to be in the middle of a faith crisis many many times i've had students um, uh, contact me in this way. I mean, even Jesus says that I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe I've spoken of heavenly things? The point is that if we can't trust what the Bible says on historical matters, on historical events, those taking place in the Old Testament, how can we trust what it says about spiritual matters like salvation? The Old Testament and New Testament are inseparable. If we let the attacks on the Old Testament go unanswered, a person's questions about whether they can trust the Old Testament will eventually ripple their way right up into the New Testament and they will find themselves questioning whether they can trust the New Testament as well. So this is our goal in apologetics in general and the goal tonight is to try to show you how fossils should be interpreted from the biblical worldview. So most people know what fossils are and we have Bill Marshallite brought a nice set of uh, fossils down front at the end, feel free to come back down again and he can uh, talk to you about what he brought. But fossils are any trace of pre-existing life that is embedded in the, in the rock record. We tend to think of fossils as things like petrified shells and petrified wood, but in reality, any trace of a pre-existing organism that's been left in the rock record is a fossil. So many times these are also things like uh, just footprints or tunnels you know, trackways that, that are often found. These are also fossils. <clears throat> and the reason why we call it a fossil record is because the fossils that we find are found in layers of rocks, like those that you see here at the Grand Canyon. And these layers of rocks essentially represent a sequence of events. The lowest layer, for example, exposed here, must have formed before the one that's above it. And the one that's above all of the others had to have formed last. So what you can do is you can kind of look at the fossils that are in those various layers and 
interpret that as a sequence of events. The problem is that it, what we must do is interpret what we're seeing. And again, the scientific community is interpreting fossils. They're not teaching us facts. When they tell us that a fossil is this old or this old or and that evolution occurred this way or that way, they're not t teaching facts. They're teaching an interpretation. What they're doing is interpreting the rock record. But this, the, the layers of rocks that you see here at, at the Grand Canyon are formed by sediments. These are what we call sedimentary rocks. Uh, sediments accumulate as, as a result of a watery act, water activities. Water or other fluids like air can erode away rocks, transport sediments, and then deposit them in a new location. The rocks that we see here, the rocks that fossils are embedded in, were formed by water. And as such, historically speaking, people always have assumed that the fossils that they've seen around the world and the layers of rocks like those you see here were formed during the biblical global flood. This was a long-standing assumption up until around 1850 when people started arguing for an alternate view of Earth's history, an alternate view of fossils. We know of the global flood from Genesis 6 through 9. I'll read a little excerpt here. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. What a, what a terrible statement that the Lord actually regretted that he, he had made human beings. And his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For again, I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God sent this terrible flood upon the earth. Terrible flood. Read just a little bit of, uh, of this as well. The waters prevailed so mightily upon the earth that all the high mountains and the whole heavens were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them by 15 cubits deep, which would be about 25 feet. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth. Birds, cattle, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm upon the earth, and every man. Everything on, who's, on dry land and whose nostrils the breath of life died. Now, there are a lot of Christians that, uh, that are very accepting of evolution, that are very accepting of what scientists are teaching today, accepting of, of the age of the earth as it's put forth. Today, the scientific community says that the, war, the earth is 4.6 billion years old, that life originated here as far back as 3.9 billion years ago, not long after it just had cooled, that the universe itself is closer to 13.9 billion years. These are the estimates. These are the ages that are put, put forth by the scientific community. And there are a lot of Christians that accept these dates, that accept evolution that is taught by the scientific community by these naturalistic scientists but it is important to note that all christians that accept evolution all christians that accept these ancient ages have rejected that the flood that's described in genesis 6 through 9 was a global event a christian that accepts evolution and accepts a 4.6 billion year earth is rejecting that the global flood that the flood of noah was a global scale event but again, if you look through this text, it's very difficult to reach that interpretation. It says all the high mountains on the whole heavens were covered. All flesh died that moved upon the earth. Everything on dry land whose nostrils of the breath of life died. These are all inclusive statements. All the high mountains, everything in dry land whose nostrils of the breath of life died. This was a global scale event. It was a global event. And one thing we need to ask ourselves, if there was an event that occurred like this, an event that is described in the Bible, is it possible for a scientist who is dedicated to philosophical naturalism, is it possible for such a scientist to reach the correct interpretation? Meaning, if the flood occurred as described in the Bible, is it possible for a scientist holding to rigid naturalism to correctly interpret the geology of that event? That's a question we should be asking ourselves. I, I urge you to be very skeptical about what science is teaching today, and I argue that it is impossible for a scientist, for a geologist, that is dedicated to explaining everything through rigid philosophical naturalism to correctly interpret the geology of the global flood, that it's not possible. 
Remember that we live in a world with a supernatural history. And I argue it's impossible for a naturalist to correctly interpret a world like ours with a supernatural history. Remember, God spoke the cosmos into existence. How's a naturalist going to explain how God spoke the cosmos into existence? What about the other miracles in the Bible? Could a scientist dedicated to naturalism explain how Jesus turned the water into wine? Could he run tests and explain how that was possible through purely natural processes? Well, the global flood was an, is an event with a significant supernatural intervention associated with it. And I argue that because of this supernatural intervention, it's impossible for a naturalist to correctly interpret the geology of this event. And this is an important point, a very, very important point. There's a strong logical argument here. But what? Now, I've, asked, I've presented this, this uh, argument many, many times and I've never had anyone tell me correctly what is it about the global flood, about that sequence of events that would prevent or preclude a geologist who is a naturalist from correctly interpreting the geology of this event described in Genesis 6 through 9? Where is the supernatural intervention that would prevent a correct interpretation? Well, it's basically this. Remember, the only reason life, the life that's alive today, the life that's living on earth on top of those vast layers of sedimentary rock, the only reason life exists today is because it was saved from this event through a tremendous act of supernatural intervention. God told Noah there was going to be a flood, told him how to survive the flood by, by instructing him how to build an ark, and the animals came to Noah. It specifically says that. The animals will come to you to be kept alive. Animals came to Noah, got on board the ark. The only reason life exists today is because of this tremendous act of supernatural intervention. But when a geologist is trying to interpret our world, remember, they're not just trying to interpret the geology of the world, but the world as it now exists. Covered by vast layers of sedimentary rocks, fossiliferous sedimentary rocks like the ones you see here, life exists today. Lots of life, fragile life. You have... Uh, just fragile little butterflies. You have cold-blooded animals that can't survive changes in temperature. You have amphibians that can't survive exposures to salt water. The earth is covered with fragile organisms that simply could not survive an event capable of laying down the layers of rocks like we see here at the Grand Canyon. But the Bible says there was just such an event, a terrible event that nothing could survive. The only reason life exists today is because of this act of supernatural intervention. God told Noah there was gonna be a flood, brought the animals to him. Because of this, this event is impossible to interpret from strict naturalism. Because the only, the only interpretation a naturalist could come to is that those layers of rocks must have formed slowly and gradually over long periods of time at a rate or in a manner that the animals alive today could have survived it on their own naturally but there was an event that nothing could survive so because of this the geology of the global flood can never be correctly interpreted we must be very skeptical about what the scientific community is, is uh, teaching today but our real interest though the focus today is really on the connection between the fossil record and the theory of evolution the fossil record is the main support the main evidence for the theory of evolution by the theory of evolution, I mean this theory, the theory that all life on earth has descended over long periods of time from simple to complex forms from ultimately from one common ancestral cell. They believe one cell evolved long time ago, 3.9 billion years ago is what they say, one cell evolved and all life on earth has descended from that one cell through mechanisms such as mutations and natural selection. But where's the evidence for this theory the main evidence for it is the fossil record but there's really two there are really two main evidences for evolution one is what's called homology if we look at the various organisms on earth we can see similarities significant similarities if we look at the mammals we see five fingers and five toes common across the mammals you look at the wing of a bat you find five fingers you look at the toes of an elephant you find five toes five fingers and five toes with birds it's four yeah uh, but in addition to that, you can look at for cellular homology. 
Um, if you look at the cells of all the organisms, they have the same basic organelles. The mitochondria and the chloroplast in plants, Golgi and endoplasmic, same basic, basic cellular architecture on all life on Earth. They all have DNA as the information-bearing molecule. Because of this level of homology, evolutionists say that all life on Earth has descended from that one common ancestor. When they look at the animals with five fingers and five toes, they say all animals with five fingers and five toes must have evolved from one common ancestor. Homology is one of their main evidences for evolution. But other than homology, the only real support that life has evolved so significantly over time comes from an interpretation of the fossil record. Interpretation of the layers of rocks that contain fossils such as that illustrated in this diagram. Basically, the fossil record is interpreted as, uh, as illustrating the change in the life forms that are on Earth over hundreds of millions of years. Uh, the evolution of organisms from simple to complex forms as recorded in the rock record. But, uh, and, I, and I hesitate and pause for a minute to consider whether to offer you an explanation now as to how it is that fossils came to be sorted. I could address that now or I can address it later, but one of, the, one of the things that we have discovered, one of the things that was eventually discovered when uh, geology started analyzing these layers of rocks and the fossils that were in them, one of the things that was realized was that fossils are not just all mixed together, that fossils are sorted. Some fossils are typically found below or above other fossils. They're not just all mixed together. And to a great many Christians, this was a great source of puzzlement. If indeed all of these fossils were the result of global flood, why aren't they all just mixed together? Why is it that you tend to find some fossils high up in the fossil record, others are deep down under, in the bottom layers of these, of these strata? Why is it that you see this? Well, what you're looking at, if we're correct that the fossil record is the result of the global flood, one of the things we need to consider is that uh, the global flood was actually a very prolonged event. We, we, all, we all remember the 40-day rain, but the, the flood itself could have lasted as much as 150 days. 150 days is mentioned a couple of times during this text, which is apparently the length of time from when the flood began on the 17th day of the second month of Noah's life to the 17th day of the seventh month of Noah's life when the ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat. Five months. 150 days, five months. It may have taken as long as five months before the flood reached the tops of the mountains and the, the very last animals and people died. So you got to kind of think about what, what you're looking at is a sequence of events, of the, the times of death of the animals that lived during the global, that were alive at prior to the global flood. More specifically, the time that they died but the, and also the time they were buried by sediments. So, in general, the explanation is that what you're looking at is the destruction of successive life zones. Several factors would come into play that would affect when an animal would be buried, would die, and be buried by sediments during the global flood. One would be their habitat elevation. Animals live at different elevations. And the animals that we would expect to be deepest in the fossil record the animals that inhabit the lowest elevations on earth are the ones that are live on the bottom of the ocean. The animals that dig, uh, burrow into the mud on the bottom of the ocean would be absolutely the ones that are the lowest in the fossil record. And that is exactly what we find. If you look at diagrams like this, the animals on the bottom of these diagrams are the animals that inhabit the lowest habitat elevations on earth. Animals that are at higher elevations would be expected above those. Animals that are even higher elevations would be expected above those. You also have some animals that move and some animals that don't. Sessile or planted forms would be expected below those that migrate. You also have animals with significantly different environmental tolerances. Some animals are very hardy. Some animals are very sensitive to environmental change, would tend to die very easily. Cold-blooded animals and amphibians would die very easily. Warm-blooded animals would die very late in an event like this. And as well, the, the warm-blooded animals are the most migratory. So what you're looking at when you see these, these sequence of fossils, 
are the different times of animals during the global flood due to different habitat elevations, different abilities to migrate, and different environmental tolerances, creating a sorting of fossils during this, during this global flood. But let me show you how scientists interpret these layers of rocks. This quote comes from Prentice Hall Biology, which is uh, arguably the most widely used biology textbook used in public schools today, Prentice Hall Biology. They describe the use of the fossil record in supporting evolution this way. By Darwin's time, they say, scientists knew that fossils were the remains of ancient life and that different layers of rock had been formed at different times during Earth's history. Darwin saw fossils as a record of the history of life on Earth. Darwin, like Charles Lyell, proposed that the Earth was many millions rather than thousands of years old. Why did they insert that in there, rather than thousands of years old? That's because everyone, or most people, know that the most straightforward reading of the Bible would argue that the Earth is very, very young, on the order of just a few thousand years old. Continuing, during this time, long, during this long time, Darwin proposed that countless species had come into being, lived for a time, and then vanished. So by comparing fossils from older rock layers with fossils from younger rock layers, scientists could document the fact that Earth had changed over time, that the organisms on Earth had changed over time. But does the fossil record really support evolution? We're going to want to look at that. What is, what does the evidence really support? This, this is a way of just summarizing the evolution versus the biblical view on fossils. And then we'll look to see which of these the evidence really supports. Evolutionists would say that fossils show that organisms evolved by purely natural processes and were buried in watery sediments over great ages, what we call geologic ages. The Bible would argue that fossils are the remains of the organisms that were created by God and were buried rapidly in watery sediments during Noah's flood. These are the two views. What does the evidence really support? First, I want to show you that the fossil record, it best supports the global flood. Show you evidence of the global flood from fossils, and then I'll come back and we'll analyze the fossil record to see if it really has what it must have to, sh to demonstrate evolution of organisms over long periods of time. Does it really have that? So evidence for the global flood. I believe the most significant evidence for the global flood comes for the, from the fact that the layers of rocks that fossils are found in are vast. Not just vast in thickness, but laterally vast as well. One of the laws of stratigraphy, one of the laws of strata is called the law of lateral continuity. The, the layers of rocks that fossils are found in are laterally continuous or horizontally indefinite. They basically blanket the continent, extend from one side to the other, unless they believe some of these have ero been eroded away. They're laterally continuous. You can trace the layers of rocks that fossils are found in for hundreds and in some cases thousands of miles. For example, the layers that you see here at the Grand Canyon, find those on this diagram by the U.S. Geologic Survey. Over on the far right, you can see the Grand Canyon and the layers of rocks that are visible there. These layers of rocks visible in the Grand Canyon can be traced all the way from Arizona to Utah and beyond. In fact, one of the layers exposed here at the Grand Canyon called the Tapete Sandstone, shown there. By the way, the Tapete Sandstone is believed to be due to a series of underwater flows of sand that is estimated to have been racing at something close to 90 miles per hour. These are ter what we call turbidity, uh, turbidity current deposits, turbidites. The Tapete Sandstone that's shown there at the Grand Canyon can be traced all the way across North America. The extent of these deposits has been deduced from oil well drilling information. That one layer of rock, the Tapete Sandstone, known by various names, known by different names of in Canada, can be traced for hundreds and in some cases thousands of miles all the way across North America. But this is not an isolated example, the Tapete Sandstone. This is the general characteristic of the fossil record. Look at this diagram. This diagram is also from the U.S. Geologic Survey, and it shows the layers of the fossil record that are on the surface in North America. 
And look, it's the general characteristic of the fossil record. The layers that are exposed there on the surface can be traced for thousands of miles, extend for thousands of miles. They're laterally continuous. It's tremendous evidence that these layers, these deposits were formed in a, during a monumental event. Interestingly, the, when, we look at, when we look today to see how sediments form, they only form in very localized situations. For example, when a river is eroding away material and carrying those sediments, and that river slows, like when it empties into a large lake or into the ocean, when that, when that uh, the velocity of the river slows, its sediment load will be deposited there, usually forming what's called a river delta, a big fan-shaped deposit. But when we look to see sediments forming today, what we only see are them forming in very localized situations. Not blanketing for thousands of miles the way, the way the fossil record generally shows them. Another piece of evidence, we find ocean fossils everywhere. And I mean everywhere. You go up to the, on the tops of the Andes and the Alps, virtually every mountain chain in the world, you go up there and what you find is clams. I mean, when you get right down to it, the fossil record is more a record of, record of clams. Does that seem like that's mostly all it is? Clams, 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 everywhere you look. But you go on to, up on top of the Andes Alps, you're going to find clams. Pretty much any mountain chain that you go to, you'll find clams. But uh, the fact that ocean fossils are on the top of a mountain is not the big deal. Because mountains do build. They do build. So ocean fossils that were once deposited when uh, on a floodplain can be forced up and that flood can't, plane can eventually end up as a plateau or further become the top of a mountain because of tectonic activity. The earth is made up of a, of a bunch of plates and these plates are moving around, pushing up against one another. Sometimes they buckle when they push together or sometimes one will just ride up on top of the other, becoming the top of a mountain. So the fact that ocean falls are on the tops of mountains isn't the big deal, okay? The big deal is that they are everywhere in Virtually every single layer of the fossil record, you find ocean fossils. When you see diagrams like this, what you see are mostly land animals and diagrams like this. But the reality is 95% of all fossils are marine invertebrates, like clams, primarily shellfish. 95% of the remaining 5% are plants. 95% of the rest are fish. Most of the rest are insects much less than 1% of the fossils in the fossil record are land vertebrates. It is a record of a dramatic global flood when the oceans came in and just destroyed the continents. When we do find land vertebrates, we find ocean fossils mixed in right there with them in almost all cases, in almost all cases. Another piece of evidence, we see fossils with extreme levels of preservation. And this is really not expected, except in isolated situations, uh, swamps where you have very low oxygen content and not a lot of decomposers in there. You find things that have been there for a good long period of time becoming mummified. But the normal sequence of events in an ecosystem is that when things die, they decompose and they decompose rapidly. To find fossils that are completely intact, like this fish, the skeleton completely intact, as well, we can see that all of the soft tissue became fossilized as well. Fossils like this are not at all expected in a normal ecosystem, in normal situations. But let's look and see how paleontologists say that fossils form and then compare that with this example of this fully articulated fish, okay? I took this description and the images directly off of a fossil website, so verbatim text, their images just to describe how fossils are said to form to aid in our understanding of this process. After death, the ammonite, the creature you see there, slowly sinks to the seafloor and scavengers feed on the fleshy body of the creature. And after only several weeks, all that remains is the shell. Several months after death, the shell gradually becomes covered with silt and sand these layers continue to build, providing a shield around the shell and protecting it from damage. Time continues to pass and more and more layers are deposited. After a few hundred years, the shell is several feet beneath the surface. A few hundred years. Gradually, the chemicals in the shell undergo a series of changes. As the shell slowly decays, water infused with minerals 
passes through it, replacing the chemicals in the shell with rock-like minerals like calcite, iron, and silica. So over millions of years, emphasis mine, the original shell is completely replaced by the minerals. And what remains is a rock-like copy of the original shell. The fossil has the same shape as the original object, but is actually rock. This is how they say fossils form. But let's compare that again with that fish fossil that we saw just a minute ago. Is that a logical sequence of events to explain how a fish could become fossilized completely intact? Skeleton completely intact, all the soft tissue still there? No, because of decomposition, because of predation and scavengers. Scavengers will come upon death of an animal like that fish, pick apart all of the tissue. The skeleton will become disarticulated, will break into pieces. Bacteria and fungi, and fungi uh, the decomposers, will break down any remaining tissue that's there. Chemical processes like oxidation will break down the bones. Nothing left becomes dust in the wind in no time. To get a fish fossil like the one I just previously showed you, that fish had to be buried with sediments rapidly. In fact, it was most likely the sediments that buried it that killed the poor fish. Sediments, upon burial by significant amounts of sediments, decomposition slows significantly. The deeper you're buried, the slower the rates of decomposition because there are fewer animals down there, fewer worms and insects to pick at you, fewer bacteria and fungi to help with decomposition as well, and less oxygen. So bur being buried deep by sediments is one way to encourage the, the fossilization. But in addition to being buried by sediments and buried rapidly to prevent decomposition, you also have to have water, water with, saturated with minerals, so that those minerals, as the tissue slowly decays, will be replaced by those minerals. These both have to happen. And that kind of uh, event sounds very much like a major catastrophic flood. So the sediments that buried this poor fish would entomb it into, into, uh, eventually into sedimentary rock, enabling it to be fossilized. But again, it will only become mineralized if there's water there as well, if water continues to deposit minerals in, uh, in place of the tissues as they decay. And we can find lots and lots and lots of examples of, of, of fossils that show almost no signs of decomposition. No sign that they died in any kind of normal circumstance. For example, look at this fish right here. Fish was uh, buried by sediments and later became a fossil before it had time to even finish gulping down its meal. See, it's got another fish in its mouth that didn't have time to finish, even finish gulping down. Or look at this extinct uh, marine reptile. This is an ichthyosaur. Was uh, buried by sediments and then later became a fossil before it had time to finish giving birth. We can find lots and lots of fossils that show almost no signs of decomposition. Delicate structures, fine details are present. The kind of structures that we would never expect to be fossilized, we find with regularity and tremendous detail. Delicate structures that allow us to identify them by species. They're so well preserved. The delicate wings of a dragonfly, eyes, we find eyes in the fossil record. Even the eyes of trilobites, an extinct arthropod. Bill had a trilobite down here. We, the, the trilobite had a, had a unique compound eye, but we know what the eye of the trilobite looked like because the eyes are so well preserved in the fossil record. You don't get eyes preserved in the fossil record unless you're buried catastrophically and rapidly by sediments to preserve those structures. And this trilobite was buried by sediments before it had time to even pull in its eye stalks. The eyes are on little eye stalks that pull in like uh, those of a snail. This big hadrosaur, this hadrosaur is 50 foot long, was buried completely intact, preserved skin and all. Hadrosaurs like this were once thought to live in swamps because this is one of the duck-billed dinosaurs. And these things were big. We're talking 50 foot long duck-billed dinosaur. I, I think we'd still run from it. Even though it had a duck bill, I'd probably still run. But it was thought that, that just like the waterfowl use their bills to sift through mud, they'll go down and pick up a mouthful of mud and, and kind of sift through it to try to catch them some insects and crawdads and whatnot. It was thought that the hadrosaur lived probably in a, in a similar habitat. 
and you'll see older pictures with them in swamps, out in the middle of swamps. But we found stomach contents of hadrosaurs so well preserved, they were able to identify what they ate, and uh, now we know that they actually lived up in the mountains. Back in 2005, a T-Rex, a Tyrannosaurus Rex, was discovered, and while transporting the femur, the, the femur of the T-Rex was so big that they had to break it in half in order to transport it. And after they got it back to the facility, to their labs, they realized that there was tissue inside the femur that looked very, very fresh. And they, they treated the tissue, were, were able to find connective tissue that would stretch and snap back to its original shape. This again from a discovery in 2005. Further analysis of the tissue revealed structures that look like blood vessels and even that look like red blood cells. And although the uh, results of this were contested for, for some time, we have now conclusively determined that what was found here was truly red blood cells and true tissues. They found uh, traces of both uh, the pigment hemoglobin as well as other substances that are only present during the breakdown of, of blood, red blood cells. So they found uh, red blood cells from a T-Rex. Maybe could they bring back the T-Rex through cloning techniques? Remember, that's how they, they brought him back in Jurassic Park. They found uh, uh, blood from a dinosaur in like amber, uh, you know, a mosquito in amber. But just so you know, red blood cells have no DNA. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus. So you couldn't do it from red blood cells. You get from, do it from other DNA from other cells, but not from red blood cells. But we have, we have found an, at this point enormous, uh, enormous number of uh, discoveries have been found of soft tissues that have pre been preserved in the rock record. I know you can't really see this list. This was published by the Institute for Creation Research. But it sh most of the examples that are shown on this list date back into the hundreds of millions of years. Hundreds of millions of years. Animals that are thought to have died that long ago yet were fossilized, and those soft tissues are still preserved today, it makes no sense. One of the best soft tissue fossil beds is found up in uh, British Columbia at what's called the Burgess Shale. Watch this. There in Burgess Shale, especially the lower level, which Walcott first exploited, the preservation is miraculous, it's astonishing. We find trilobites, of course, but we find many, many other sorts of arthropods almost none of which are ever found in a typical Cambrian assemblage. So we can treat them effectively as being soft-bodied. They have almost no chance of being fossilized in normal circumstances. Geologists believe that the animals of the Burgess Shale were buried quickly and alive by an avalanche of sediment that created an airtight tomb and prevented the decay of soft body parts like eyes, legs, and internal organs. Now, in the animal Morella, very often there's a sort of what we call a dark stain. And I find this very intriguing because that dark stain evidently is the body contents are oozing out. So in other words, the animal is beginning to decay and then something stops it. On many of the arthropods, we have the most delicate uh, branches and you can see every single fine hair along them. Quite astonishing, similarly the antennae going out like that. In particular instances, we have some worms, so we see the outside of the body. We can see various things at the front, which enable the worm to burrow through the sediment. But then you look at the animal itself, and you can see this sinuous reflective line. And of course you say, oh, that's the gut. That's the alimentary canal. And then in certain cases, you actually look at one part of the alimentary canal, and you can actually see food inside it. Shellfish, which is swallowed. It is a remarkable insight into a fossil you'd never expect to be fossilized. Finding soft tissues, finding these kind of tissues preserved in the rock record can be interpreted only one way. Catastrophic, rapid burial by sediments. There's no other way that you get such tissues preserved. Another main major uh, piece of evidence that argues that fossils are the result of catastrophic flooding are the mass mortality beds that we find. We find fossils in massive graveyards. They call these, oftentimes call these fossil graveyards. Whole herds of elephants have been found all fossilized together in big mass. And when I was in school, the explanation they gave us as to how these big like elephant graveyards came to be 
is that that was a traditional place where those elephants would go to die. Like that was just their traditional place to go to die. Like when you, when you get uh, old, when you're, you know, maybe you get an injury, get, get, your, get your hip starting to go out, then you just wander off to that place where your mom had died and wait there for life to take you. Well, that was their explanation. They have found uh, numerous rhinoceros in a cave. What kind of events necessary to drive rhinoceros up in a cave? But we see lots and lots of these mass mortality beds, massive fossil graveyards. In, the, in North America, there are dinosaur accumulations in the tens of thousands, tens of thousands of just centrosaurs found within the Morrison Formation here in the United States. Massive, massive numbers of animals all buried together. Show you some other examples. Whole communities of organisms buried in mass, showing almost no signs of decomposition. And oftentimes you find these fossils oriented. You can find that, that there's a direction to, their, to, to the way that they're laid down, showing that they were buried by sediments that were flowing fast enough in one direction to orient all the fossils like that. I found uh, another kind of mass mortality bed that was un, I was unaware of previously called a log jam bed. Specific kind of fossil bed called a log jam bed. Uh, most people know what a log jam is, but I'll uh, explain what it is just in case. You know, back in the old days, before they had big trucks to haul these timbers on after they cut them, these, before they, when they cut these trees down, they would drag them down into the river and release them into the river. The river would transport the logs, and the timber mills were usually downstream on the river, on the riverbank. But every once in a while, one of these logs would get hung up on something, and then all the logs behind it would end up piling up on it, creating a log jam. And then they would have to send some poor guy out there on top of the logs with a pole or something, trying to pry these things loose and get them moving again, called a log jam. Well, this kind of fossil bed, called a log jam bed, is believed to have formed similarly. A bunch of animals floating down river that all got piled up together and it all got buried together in mass. But again, sounds very much like a catastrophic flooding kind of a, a burial. There's a very famous dinosaur trackway in Australia shown here. Uh, contains footprints of uh, something close to 150 dinosaurs that made something like 4,000 footprints in this one little area. Very, very famous dinosaur trackway there in Australia. So important uh, that they built a huge conservatory over the whole thing. The building you see there in that image, big conservatory they built over these footprints to preserve them from eroding away and to, and, uh, to provide a little visitor center so you could go and marvel at the dinosaur footprints preserved in the mud there. But uh, the explanation of these is that these dinosaurs, these 150 dinosaurs that created the footprints were running from a predator. And that's because they're all running in the same direction. All these footprints are going in the same direction. And so the explanation is they must have been running from something. Running in, uh, and so if you ever heard of a bunch of dinosaur footprints that were running from a predator, that's, this is the one they're talking about. But uh, back in 2013, some researchers at the University of Queensland published an article in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology arguing that these tracks were formed when these dinosaurs were underwater. Because what they find are footprints, most of the footprints are just like tippy-toe footprints. That the full foot is not present. Uh, in particular, the back part of the foot is not there. They argued that these di dinosaurs that created these type of footprints must have been buoyant. Must have been at least partially buoyant. So they were touching the bottom, but not, a, not bearing their full weight down on it. So interesting, you know. They could have been running after all, but maybe instead of running from a predator, they're running from a... Uh, a terrible catastrophe that was driving them into, a, into that direction. We also find fossils that are described as being in a death pose. This was first brought to my attention when I had uh, John Morris from the Institute for Creation Research come and speak at uh, the Seattle Creation Conference a few years ago. And he uh, brought up these death pose fossils. So I went in and looked them up. Sure enough, find lots and lots of these death pose fossils. Uh, uh, fossils like this of, of, of uh, reptiles and others that have long necks and long, this one has a long tail, but it's a long neck in particular that is arched way back. Look and see how his neck is arched. So it is believed that this was an animal that, that was struggling to survive, that was probably trapped in mud, 
and uh, was struggling to get free and eventually just became exhausted and, uh, and died right there in what they call a death pose. That's what they say they are. And I, after looking at those, these, though, I found lots and lots of these online. Started just looking for, uh, looking for fossils to find lots and lots of death pose. Be death pose fossils, in fact, all the Archaeopteryx fossils that I found are death pose fossils. Now, we're going to get into uh, talking about evolution here in just a little bit and what transitional forms are, but the Archaeopteryx is one of the evolutionists, like, favored transitional forms. They argue that the, uh, the Archaeopteryx is, was a reptile that's in the process of evolving into a bird because it has, like, some bird characteristics and, but also some, like, teeth and such that they say makes it a transitional form. So, but interesting. The evolutionist's favorite transitional form, interpreted another way, is just another animal that was trapped in mud trying to free itself during a terrible catastrophe, biblical flood of Noah. So I want to kind of change gears and again look to the fossil record to see if it has what it needs to have, if it has the characteristics that it needs to have to support evolution. I argue that it has the characteristics we would expect for it to have if it was formed during the biblical global flood. The, the fossil record is a monumental body of evidence for the global flood, for the biblical flood. There couldn't be, possibly be any more evidence for a single event than there is for the global flood. And it's unmistakable. Unless you're dedicated to naturalism, then it's impossible to interpret that way. But let's look at it from the evolutionary point of view. Again, the fossil record is the evolutionist's main support for the theory of evolution. Other than homology, it's the fossil record. And again, by evolution, I mean this theory, the theory that all life on Earth has descended over long periods of time from common ancestors. This interpretation, this, the evidence for this comes by way of the fossil record. Again, the sorting of fossils that you see, and that you see it's illustrated, for example, in this diagram, they would argue that the fossil record illustrates a the, the, that organisms have changed through time have evolved from simple to complex forms over a long period of time. They argue that this is illustrated by way of the fossil record. But does it really illustrate evolution or just a variety of very distinct animals that are all buried in different layers? Does it really show evolution, the changes of organisms? Does it really show that? Because what's, what it really must show are, is a sequence of fossils that show an evolutionary process. You should be able to find an animal that's gradually changing from one form into another through a series of fossil deposits, like the one illustrated in this diagram. Can evolutionists point to any examples like this of fossils showing animals evolving through time, from aquatic animals into land animals, for example, or from land animals into aquatic animals? Remember, all the whales are... are said to have evolved from land animals. Can they really show any of these significant transitions? Or what about from the reptiles into birds? Can they really show this by way of transitional fossils like this? Now, understand that uh, Darwin himself did not invent evolution. Darwin did not invent evolution. There are many evolutionists of Darwin's day. What uh, Darwin really brought to the table was a mechanism, natural selection, but also with that mechanism, he argued for a very slow and gradual process because he envisioned the same process that breeders use to create various pigeon breeds, for example. Darwin himself was a breeder of pigeons. He was well familiar with how these various odd breeds were created through selective breeding techniques. And he, he, when he saw the various species out there in the world, he assumed that these various species came about through the same process, what he called natural selection, rather than man-induced or artificial selection. But he knew that this process would occur, would occur over many, many, many generations, a very, very slow and gradual process. And he was, uh, in, in the origin of species though, he, he uh, is unable to point to fossils to illustrate this point. And he actually gives a carefully worded apology that he can't point to any fossils and, but, and predicted, assumed that the fossils would eventually be found to prove his theory true. Most of the evolutionists of Darwin's day held to a mechanism of evolution called saltation. They believed that evolution must occur in rapid jumps. 
saltation or saltatory evolution was the view of Darwin's day. What Darwin argued for is a slow and gradual process, not rapid, jumping kind of evolution. But the reason why ev the people of Darwin's day held to a saltatory mechanism is that when they looked around at living populations, what they saw were distinct groups of organisms separated from one another by enormous gulfs. When, they, when you look at the fossil record, you see those same basic organisms. The same basic animals alive today are in the fossil record. But again, you see enormous gaps between distinct groups. This led to a saltatory mechanism for evolution. They, they argue that, that organisms must evolve in a, series, in a big jump so as to not leave those transitional forms in either living populations or in the fossil record. Okay? Listen to, listen to this. The distinctness of specific forms, and their not being blended together by innumerable transitional links, is a very obvious difficulty. Darwin speaking. I allude to the manner in which species belonging to several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous rocks. When Darwin was writing The Origin of Species, it was well known at the time that the first fossils of animals appeared suddenly without precursors in the geological record. So there was a deep conflict between what his theory told him to expect to find, namely an abundance of transitional forms going back to that common ancestor for the animals, versus what was there in the fossil record. Darwin knew that if his theory was true, the older rock strata directly beneath the Cambrian layer should reveal a progression of fossils connecting simple earlier forms to complex animals like trilobites through a trail of incremental steps and failed biological experiments. Such evidence would document the trial and error process of natural selection. But Darwin says in the origin, where are these transitional forms? They're not there in the fossil record. What we see instead are fully formed, discrete groups. Now that's a world-class puzzle for someone like Darwin. Look, see, Darwin predicted that the fossils would eventually be found. Couldn't point to them then, 150 years ago. Can we point to them today? That's the question. And understand that what we're, the gaps we're talking about here are enormous gaps. Um, enormous gaps. For example, the, the invertebrate phyla the various invertebrate phyla are as dis distinct from one another as they can possibly be. You cannot create organisms more different from one another than the various invertebrate phyla are. The cnidarians, for example, your jellyfish and uh, sea anemones and coral, for example, are as distinct from the other phyla as you possibly can be. The, 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 the echinoderms there, your starfish, the mollusks where your clams are, the arthropods for trilobites. I mean, these various invertebrate phyla are as distinct from other, one another as they could possibly be. And there's just no indication which, what these phyla evolved from. When we find them in the fossil record, they're basically perfectly formed. And most of them are identical to the animals we still find alive today. No indication what evolved into the first cnidarian or the first echinoderm. They just poof, suddenly appear in the fossil record, perfectly formed. And we're talking about highly, highly specialized animals. Or what about, what evolved into the first vertebrate? No indication. No, no Nothing in the fossil record to really show these kind of significant transitional periods, transitional forms. And again, we're talking about highly, highly, highly specialized animals. When they first appear in the fossil record, they're perfectly formed. Even the flying animals, first time they appear in the, appear in the fossil record, perfectly formed flyers. Evolution teaches that flying animals evolved from land animals. But new discoveries here in Germany are causing problems for this theory. There's a 10 million year period of early mammal evolution where you would guess that there'd be some sort of a bat precursor, but once again, nothing. Bingo, they just show up. Here's a very highly complex mammal with all these adaptations, and bingo, they just show up at some particular moment in time fully formed as a bat. Obviously, we evolutionary biologists and paleontologists don't believe that, but at this point we don't have a good fossil ancestor for them. This same problem occurs not only for bats, but also for flying reptiles. When the pterosaurs uh, first appear in the geological record, they were completely, uh, they were perfect. 
You get perfect pill results. Yeah. First time they appear, boom, out of nowhere, just perfectly formed, highly specialized animals. Now you will see some paleontologists admit to this problem, admit to the absence of transitional forms, but it's rare. Um, Stephen Jay Gould admitted to this. Stephen Jay Gould, arguably one of the most famous evolutionists, famous paleontologists of our day. He was uh, even featured on an episode of The Simpsons. Anybody else watch cartoons, The Simpsons? Good. So Stephen Jay Gould was on an episode of The Simpsons, literally. Uh, he said the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees, he says, that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, but not the evidence of fossils. Look for them. Look for these phylogenetic trees to see where the labels are missing. It's all the important points that are missing, all those important branch points, the bases. You, you don't have any of those identified. The only ones that are identified are they're basically the ones that are still alive today. I want you to listen to, to understand the significance of the gaps, again, in, in these transitional forms. I want to let uh, David Berlinski speak to this. David Berlinski, a brilliant guy, a PhD from Princeton, who, who's taught at Stanford, Rutgers, City University of New York, and the University of Perry. Uh, listen to what he says about the uh, transitional forms and, and the number of them that we should find in the fossil record. The question has to be raised, as it should be raised whenever an evolutionary sequence is mentioned. What are exactly the predictive properties one would expect to find as one passes from a, a land-dwelling creature to a sea-dwelling creature? Specifically, how many changes are required to go from a creature such as Ambulocetus natans, which seemed to have been a, a land-dwelling creature, to, some, uh, to a creature that spends the entire portion of its life in the ocean. Uh, curiously enough, this is not a question that evolutionary biologists ask a whole lot. I did some uh, seed of the end, back of the envelope calculations myself, and the most modest estimate I could come up with is that um, an organism requires roughly 50,000 morphological changes to adapt itself to the open-going ocean. And as soon as we introduce a quantitative estimate, however loose, however flabby, however spontaneous, then a great deal of puzzlement starts to uh, intrude into the otherwise sunny picture. 50,000 changes, and we've got two members of a sequence. Where are the other 49,999 members of that sequence if Darwinian changes are incremental and they're small? After all, we're not talking about changes that are arbitrary. A creature must have these changes if it's to survive in the open ocean. And any, any attempt to put a quantitative number should induce a profound sense of perplexity because the number of changes are so much greater than anything we see in the transitional record. Now, what is the proper explanation for this? Please understand, I don't have it. But neither do the other guys. Neither do the other guys. And in my opinion, they refuse to recognize the legitimacy of the question. That is a fundamental question in paleontology. How many changes are required? Can those changes be compared to the fossil record? And if they are compared to the fossil record, why do we see such deficiencies in the record as compared to the necessary changes? Very important issues. Hmm. What does the fossil record really show? Well, it doesn't show what Darwin envisioned, a tree of life like this, organisms connected together or through a continuum of fossils or living organisms. We don't find this. We don't find this at all. And Dar Darwin did sketch a tree like this. Uh, they actually have it in a museum. I've seen his little sketchbook where he sketched out a little tree of life, life like that. But what instead we find in living populations and in the fossil record are distinct groups of animals separated from one another by these enormous gaps. The continuum, uh, the evolutionary continuum that, that is expected through slow and gradual changes over many, many countless generations is just not found. We don't see those in living populations. We don't see in the fossil record. But uh, this is often downplayed in textbooks. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, Prentice Hall Biology speaks to the absence of transitionals, tries to downplay it, and then says something that I want to explain. Prentice Hall Biology, again, one of the most widely used biology textbooks used in public schools today. They say, since Darwin's time, the number of known fossil forms has grown enormously. 
Researchers have discovered many hundreds of transitional fossils that document the various intermediate stages in the evolution of modern species from organisms that are now extinct. Gaps remain, of course, in the fossil records of many species, although a lot of them shrink each year as new fossils are discovered. These gaps do not, however, they say, indicate weakness in the theory of evolution itself. Rather, they point out uncertainties in our understanding of exactly how some species evolve. What they mean by that is that uh, what they're now considering is the possibility that evolution occurs in rapid jumps. Stephen Jay Gould popularized a theory called punctuated equilibrium. He said organisms could occur, uh, evolve very quickly in a punctuated manner and then establish a period of equilibrium. So we would find fossils during this period of equilibrium, but we wouldn't expect to find fossils during this rapid or punctuated jump. But punctuated equilibrium is basically saltation that, Dar that the evolutionists of Darwin's day held to. Darwin proposed that no, so evolution doesn't occur in jumps. We, the fossils will be eventually found, but here we are 150 years later. Can't point to the fossils. The gaps are real. And so scientists are back to proposing a jumping mechanism of evolution. I want to show you another clip that again just better illustrates the dis major distinction we find in the various phyla the enormity of the gaps that are present sea stars are different from jellyfish uh, different from worms and, and different from crabs and, and lobsters so each group has their unique features to make them very different from the next group the stability of these forms in the animals that exemplify the distinct phyla contradict Darwin's vision of an interconnected tree of life. The phyla don't blend imperceptibly one into another. Arthropods, for example, didn't evolve from chordates. Uh, mollusks aren't the offspring of sponges. Instead, a phylum is, in effect, as different as it can be from another phylum. So, how did these differences arise? If one reads The Origin of Species, it's clear that Darwin's caught in a bind. Natura non facit saltum. That was Darwin's famous Latin phrase, which means nature takes no sudden leaps. In fact, Darwin went on to say that if you found evidence of saltation, of, of sudden appearance in the fossil record, that would be something like evidence of, of special creation. We also find an enormous number of out-of-place fossils, out-of-place fossils. Now, again, their, their interpretation of the fossil record basically is this. The first time an animal appears in the fossil record is the time that it first evolved. The, the last time an animal appears in the fossil record is believed to be the time that it went extinct, okay? But we find out, fossils out of place all the time, out of sequence, not where they're supposed to be, and they can explain away a lot of these. They do, they explain away a lot of out-of-place fossils usually by claiming that a secondary erosion event had taken place. Because if a bed of fossils, one of these big beds of strata with fossils, is eroded and then redeposited, you could essentially invert an entire sequence of fossils. Because the top layer will erode away first and be deposited. The layer that was beneath it will erode away next and will be deposited on top and so on. So they can explain away a lot of out-of-place fossils, but some of them they just can't explain away. Again, uh, the last time an animal appears in the fossil record is believed to be the time that it went extinct. And if their interpretation of the fossil record is correct, then, uh, you know, we really shouldn't find any animals alive today that are absent from all of the upper layers of the fossil record. But there are. For example, the coelacanth. If you look at this diagram, you see the coelacanth way down here, thought to have lived and then gone extinct way back during the time of the dinosaur. Thought to have gone extinct 70 million years ago, the coelacanth, until suddenly a fisherman pulled one up and uh, it was discovered in 1938. The coelacanth, uh, it's one of the lobe fin fishes, uh, uh, sarcopterygii, lobe fin fishes. It has these big fleshy fins and evolutionists argue that not only was this fish extinct, but it probably had evolved into an amphibian because it has these big fleshy fins and they, they marked it as a significant transitional form, one that would probably, had probably worked in you know, enabling aquatic animals to occupy terrestrial habitats. 
But uh, then suddenly, but it, again, it was thought to have gone extinct back during the time of the dinosaurs until we found one living alive. And now they've caught a bunch of these things. They live deep in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Madagascar, and they've caught like 80 of these things so far. They're still worth a lot of money because they're still very rare, but uh, there you go, the coelacanth. Why, it was, why was it absent from all the upper layers of the fossil record? But an interesting note, um, again, they argued that this was a transitional form. It's got these big fleshy fins, sarcopterygii, instead of the ray fin fishes like most of them are, actinopterygii. So they argued that these fleshy fins probably allowed it to crawl up on land. But we didn't, where did they find them? It wasn't on the continental shelf, wasn't in shallow oceanic waters, but deep in the Indian Ocean which is why we didn't know that they were uh, still alive today. Not at all in the environment that would uh, be conducive for eventually crawling up on land. They didn't live in shallow waters. I can show you many others, many other out-of-place fossils. This is the Wolumi pine. It was discovered in 1994 after being thought to be extinct for 150 million years. It was discovered in the Blue Mountains in Sydney, Australia. You can now buy these online. If you want to get you a Wolumi pine, you can buy one, have it shipped to your home. Or this one, the Loatian rock rat, was uh, believed to have gone extinct 11 million years ago until it was discovered being sold for meat in a meat market in Laos. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who knows, maybe with a little bit of, uh, you know, hot sauce and some mozzarella or something. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe so. <laughs> in 2005, they found a mammal shown here with a dinosaur in its stomach with the dinosaur in his stomach. The dinosaur is uh, in the upper right of that uh, picture. You really got to know, uh, I guess, what dinosaur anatomy is like to be able to identify the stomach contents of that poor little mammal there. But the reason why this was such a, a, a monumental discovery was because at the time of this discovery, it was believed that mammals of this size did not live at the time of the dinosaurs. They will not be convinced that their interpretation of the fossil record is incorrect unless you literally find one in the belly of another. They will explain away out-of-place out of fossils by stating that it was a secondary erosion event. But you can't ex explain away some, especially if you find one in the belly of another. To be convinced that humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time, you're going to have to find a, a dinosaur with a human in its stomach or, or vice versa. You know, probably tastes like chicken. I would, and think about the, think about those big thighs on that T-Rex, that's a big drumstick, that's all I'm saying, big drumstick in that, you know. We find, also find lots and lots and lots of living fossils. A living fossil is a, an animal that's alive today, but has a representative in the fossil record that's basically identical. And I could give you a huge list of living fossils, the ones that I placed on this slide are just living fossils that date into the more than 100 million years. But we find lots of living fossils. Now, understand that the general interpretation of these layers of rocks, like I showed you the Grand Canyon, sandstone, limestone and shale, the various kinds of sedimentary rocks that we find you know, around the world, the general interpretation is that these different sediments form in different environments, different, different depositional environments. First it was a desert, and then it was a swamp, and then an ocean came in and inundated it. Then maybe you went back to a you know, foresty region, then a desert. That the Earth's environments changed dramatically throughout the history of life on Earth. If it, there was such change, we really wouldn't expect to find animals that lived for hundreds of millions of years and to still be identical today as those in the fossil record. But there's lots of these. Look at this. The stingray dates back 50 million years. Stingray we, stingray we find today is basically identical. Stingrays we find the fossil record. Squids, basically identical today as the ones we find that date back to 160 million years. Lobsters date back 200 million years, and they're identical today as the ones we find the fossil record. Cockroaches as well are identical. Stink bugs are identical to the ones we find the fossil record. Frogs are identical to the frogs we find the fossil record. Bats, again, Identical to the ones we find in the fossil record. And remember the first time a bat appears in the fossil record? Perfect bat. Perfectly formed bat. No indication what evolved into that bat. 
More and more and more. Lizards are identical in the fossil record. Centipedes are identical. Spiders are identical. Flying ants find the fossil record identical. Snakes, turtles, crickets, scorpions, flies. Over and over and over again. You could just continue to go on and on. Animals that are identical today to specimens we find in the fossil record. No indication that they've evolved from something else. And they didn't evolve into anything else. They're still a lot, still the same today. But one of the biggest challenges to the evolutionist interpretation of the fossil record, again, remember, it's just an interpretation, is what's called the Cambrian explosion. Cambrian explosion was an evolutionary event so sudden, they call it an explosion. In this Time Magazine article, they called it evolution's big bang. At one point in time, at a, during a geological era they call the Cambrian, most of the invertebrate phyta that we have today just appear suddenly. Boom! So instantly, it's, it was an explosion of life on Earth. Nothing but bacteria, 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 for, according to them, billions of years, and then suddenly at one point in time, boom! All of the major invertebrate phyta that we have today appear suddenly. Darwin acknowledged a problem that defied explanation, the Cambrian fossil record. Here are the basic body plans of major animal groups that still exist today, and many others now extinct, made their first appearance in the fossil record so suddenly that biologist Richard Dawkins noted, it is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. The current uh standard estimates for the origin of life put it at about 3.8 billion years ago, let's say 4 billion. So if we start the clock then, our 24-hour clock, six hours, nothing but these simple single-celled organisms appear, the same sort that we saw in the beginning. 12 hours, same thing. 18 hours, same thing. Three quarters of the day has passed, and all we have are these simple single-celled organisms. Then at about the 21st hour, in the space of about two minutes, boom, most of the major animal forms appear in the form that they currently have in the present. And many of them persist to the present, and we have them with us today. Less than two minutes out of a 24-hour period. That's how sudden the Cambrian explosion was. Since Darwin, excavations on every continent have revealed the magnitude of the explosion of life, an event that was clearly global in scope. Well, a Cameron explosion is exactly what it says it is. It's an explosion. Now, not explosion in terms of pieces of animal flying all over the place. But actually, when biologists talk about an explosion, what they mean is effectively an enormous diversification, what we call a radiation. So we have, during the Cambrian, what appears to be the abrupt appearance of animals. We're filling the barrel with lots of different types of organisms. But we're also inventing nervous systems, we're inventing eyes, we're inventing how to move quickly. So the whole world is speeding up. It's an event where, in many respects, everything changes forever. So what does the fossil record really support? It doesn't support Darwin's tree of life. We don't see number of fossil forms slowly and gradually increasing over time, number of fossils, number of types of organisms slowly increasing over time. We don't see that. We don't see what Darwin predicted. Instead, what we see by way of the fossil record is a sudden appearance of life, sudden appearance of multiple types of organisms at the exact same time, and then continued diversification after that. Fossil record just does not support evolution. What does the evidence really support? It doesn't support uh, the sudden appearance of life on Earth, argues strongly against a, a gradual evolutionary mechanism for their origin. The absence of transitional forms, again, argues strongly against an evolution interpretation of the fossil record. The abundance of living fossils, the out-of-place fossils that we see, again, argue strongly against an evolutionist interpretation. But instead, what the fossil record better supports is a global flood 
based interpretation. The lateral continuity of strata, the fact that the layers of rocks at Fossil are found in blanket, vast areas of continents, stretch for hundreds and in some cases thousands of miles. The abundance of marine fossils, ocean fossils found throughout the fossil record, the highly preserved nature of fossils tells us they were buried rapidly and suddenly, allowing no time for decomposition, and the mass mortality beds. Again, all of these argue strongly for a catastrophic basis for the fossil record it is a record it is a record but rather than being a record of the history of life on earth over hundreds of millions of years proof of evolution what it is is a record of a devastating global flood that was sent by god because of the wickedness of the human race on the earth one of the things uh again i want to reiterate and and uh ask you to keep in mind is the fact that what the scientific community is trying to do today is interpret our world through rigid philosophical naturalism. But uh, we live in a world that was created by, created by God, spoke the universe into existence, formed humans and animals from the dust of the ground. This is not the kind of process that we would be able to as ascribe a, a natural explanation to. And remember that in 2 Peter, we were, we were warned that in the end times, scoffers would come deliberately ignoring the fact that there was a global flood. Look at this, from 2 Peter 3 through 6. He says, first of all, you must understand this, that scoffers will come the last day with scoffing and following their own passions and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For all things have continued as they were from the beginning. And they, they will deliberately ignore this fact, he says, that the word that of God, that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and an earth that formed out of water and by the means of water through which the world that then existed was deluged of water and perished. We live in such a time. The evidence for the global flood is monumental. It's all around us, but it is being deliberately ignored because of an adherence to naturalism. I'm gonna show you one more video that just kind of uh, nailed this closed. And so it's very, very striking, and one can see why Charles Darwin was so puzzled by the Cameron explosion, because he had enough knowledge even at that time to realize that deep in the Earth history, you just didn't find the animals. If my theory be true, it is indisputable that before the lowest Cambrian stratum was deposited, long periods elapsed, and during these periods of time, the world swarmed with living creatures. To the question of why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earlier periods prior to the Cambrian, I can give no satisfactory answer. Darwin was deeply troubled by the Cambrian explosion. He called it an inexplicable mystery, but he wasn't about to abandon his theory and instead proposed that the animals just looked like they appeared suddenly because he thought that the fossil record was incomplete. So Darwin argued, well, perhaps Paleontological discovery, digging through the rocks, needed more time, that the transitions were out there, that not enough collecting had occurred, not enough sampling, if you will, of the fossil record on Earth, and given time, those transitions would turn up. During the past 150 years, fossil hunters have searched the Earth for the many transitional links Darwin's theory requires. If I sent you on a treasure hunt and said, what I really want is this, you're going to go out and look for this, whatever it happens to be. Well, if you come at the fossil record with a Darwinian expectation of an abundance of transitionals, that's what's going to get you a professorship. You find those transitional forms. So all over the world, in countless outcrops, people have been looking for those forms that would capture the major transitions in the history of life. This search has extended from the walls of the Grand Canyon to the shores of the Irish Sea. And as countless specimens have been excavated, one question endures. How complete is the Cambrian fossil record? I think the Cambrian fossil record is surprisingly complete. I think it may be more complete than we realize. The reason for that is, for instance, if you look at the stratigraphy of the world, if I go and collect Cambrian rocks in Wales and find turned fossils, if I then go to China, I don't find the same species, but I find the same sorts of fossils. If I go into Carboniferous rocks, I go to Canada, 
they're the same as what I find in this country. So there is a clear set of faunas and floras which take us through geological time. The overall framework is falling into position. There's no question that if you dig and sample more, you're going to find new kinds of fossils. But generally speaking, the fossils that we find fall into groups that we already knew about. When you see that, what I think nature is telling you is you've got a pretty good sample of the history of life on Earth. The groups that you already had established are the ones that capture the new fossils. To the paleontologists, the lack of intermediate fossils is well known. Some people still think that if you look long and hard enough, you will eventually find them. But I think most of the paleontologists that I have been in contact would not have that hope very high. They simply feel that we have looked long and hard enough and that they are not there. They are not there. The difficulty of assigning any good reason for the absence of vast piles of strata, rich in fossils, beneath the Cambrian system is very great. The case at present must remain inexplicable and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. The fossils simply are not there. But I think, for, at least for me, one, I think one of the most troubling things about all this, about their interpretation, them reinterpreting the fossil record to suit their own worldview, is uh, what the fossil record was meant to be for us. And that was an important reminder. I mean, we, we set up monuments to remind us of specific events. People set them up after wars, uh, cataclysmic events. We set up monuments to remind us of these kind of things. The fossil record was a monument. When, the, when Joshua and, the, and the, the Israelites crossed the Jordan, they set up a monument right there with 12 stones. Well, the, the fossil record, these layers of rocks and the fossils they contain are also a monument, an important monument that were to remind us, to remind pe God's people to the end of time of this event and remind us just how much God hates sin. We should never forget this. We've kind of, we've lost the fear of God that we're reminded to have over and over and over throughout scripture, from old through New Testament, we're reminded to fear God. We should remember what God did in that day of that flood, that that is how much he hates sin. God hates sin. He hates it when it we allow it to persist within our life, and we should remember that. When we look at these vast layers of sedimentary rocks and the fossils they contain, we should remember this event, this terrible event, and shudder at the thought that one day we will be standing in the hand of the Almighty God that hates sin that much. And then consider whether or not he would be more or less happy about us allowing sin to persist in our life today after he sent his son. So we should never forget this. God hates sin. But just like he provided Noah and his family a way of being saved from that event, he's provided a way for us to be saved as well. But that salvation comes by repentance and that asking for forgiveness through the sacrifice that Jesus made. But repentance is required. We don't talk enough about sin, God's hatred for sin and the necessity for repentance. But we should all examine ourselves, identify sins that may be in our life and uh, do our best to get rid of those if we wanna have a relationship with, with our Father in heaven. Let me close out with a word of prayer. Father, uh, we thank you so much for your word, for your, the word of God that gives us tremendous insight in, into our world gives us knowledge about our world's ancient history that, that we so much need. Father, we, just th we thank you for, the, for your word and the tremendous insight there. Father, we, uh, we also ask for, for renewed conviction, Father, for any sins that may be on, in our lives, Father. Help us to identify the things that are in our life that shouldn't be there. Renew the conviction that maybe we once felt but have grown cold to. Help us, Lord, convict us of the sins that are in our life and help us to purify ourselves. 
so that we may be seen in your eyes as, a, as that righteous being and can have a r- close and personal relationship with you. Father, we ask for wisdom to be an effective witness for you, to understand the world that we live in and be able to, to teach people about the truth of your creation, the true history of the world as we know it because of your word. Father, we ask for wisdom to help us understand the science that we are hearing, to understand how measurements are taken and understand the data so we can, we can interpret those findings ourselves consistent with the biblical world. We, we ask for wisdom. We ask for conviction. We ask for wisdom, Father. And we take a moment just to praise you and thank you, remembering what it is that you've made for us, this wonderful world. We consider the cosmos and how great and mighty you are, how great your creation is, and this wonderful world that is so perfect, so perfect for us. We praise you for what it is that you've done, and we are humbled as sinners before you to know that such great love exists, that you have sent your son to die for us. We are sorry, so sorry that it was our sins, that it was my sin that caused such a sacrifice to be necessary. We praise you and we thank you. We glorify you. We praise the name of the Lord God. Praise your holy name. All things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.